first of all, thanks uh, to Leonard and Stephen from Rafflein for inv inviting me today. Um, since I've, uh, this is the first meetup um, for applied AI, I wasn't sure what the mix would be in the audience, so I tried to pick something that was a little bit commercial, a little bit data science-y, but I don't know, I hope most of you can learn something. Um, okay. So um, I finished a PhD last year in signal processing and machine learning, and then I joined the data science team at Kimlinx. These are my lovely colleagues. Um, Eric and Sahan, they're sitting at the back. They'll, they'll be taking all the hard questions at the end. Um, and that's uh, Martin Goodson, who's the VP of data science. So uh, what does Skimlinx do? Um, so Skimlinx uh, is a tech company and they work in the affiliate uh, market, marketing industry. Uh, these are all our publisher partners. So we have some big names like Daily Mail, um, Refinery29. And so basically, uh, we help publishers monetize their content. So when a user uh, goes on Daily Mail and they read an article about some shoes from Prada uh, and they decide they like it, they can afford it, uh, then they can just click on the link uh, and then Skimlinx is the, the technology that runs on the site and then um, helps reward the publisher for that purchase. Um, so publishers, they uh, install the Skimlinx JavaScript on their site, so which means that we get a lot of data. Um, oh, yes. Uh, so we launched a new line of products last week, so it's called Skimlinx Audiences. So the affiliate marketing was, is the core business of Skimlinx, but this is the new stuff that we're coming up with and uh, that, yeah, it's quite new. Uh, so basically, Skimlinx audiences is uh, we, uh, we can uh, understand user behavior. So we can see when a user visited uh, a web page, uh, we try to understand the content of the page using some NLP uh, technology. And then we also add some of um, other, you know, other type of metadata that we have about products. And uh, then finally, we come up with uh, groups of users that we believe are interested in a product category or some brand. Um, and we give back that back to our publishers. Um, so we have a really big scale. Uh, this is per month, so billions of page impressions. So this is when a user goes on a page, then we record that event. Uh, and we, we have that in some uh, massive NoSQL no database. Um, then we, have, we work with also lots of merchants. Um, we have lots of clicks, lots of everything. Um, great. So what I wanted to talk today is about um, how can we take all the data sources in a company and kind of combine them together um, so traditionally, businesses have always had uh, their client information stored in nice databases with fixed schema, with uh, you know structured, uh, you know, so with structured columns, and uh, typically using SQL to access that data. And we're talking about maybe millions of rows, you know, if it's a large database. Um, and, but more and more now, increasingly, um, if you are a business that has a web service, you will also start recording event data from your website. And we're talking now, this is the world of big data, so now we're talking about maybe billions of rows or billions of um, events in your database, and you don't really store it anymore in a relational database, maybe you store it as a text file in a, a HTFS or maybe some, some other place. Um, so these two databases, or these two data sources, they represent different views of your business. And you might want to combine the information stored in both to get like uh, an enriched data pipeline. So how can you do that? Uh, yes. Okay, so this is an example I picked, just to make it more concrete. Um, so. Let's imagine that um, at Skimlinx we have a relational database where we store the information about our, our publisher network. 
So whenever a publisher joins Skimlinks, they have to fill in a form uh, on the web where they say uh, what their domain is, the, the type of site they are, is it a blog, is it a forum, uh, which vertical they belong to or category. So are you a, a fashion e-commerce website or technology website? Uh, and that is stored in a SQL database. Um, and then uh, we also have those text files that I just mentioned where we record, uh, we have event data, uh, so we have page impressions. We know that uh, a certain uh, user, of course, like everything is anonymous, uh, went on this website um, and so what we would like to know is, uh, is this website uh, a technology website, is this website a forum? So we would like to, we'd be interested in enriching that information that we have about the, the event with extra information that we also have in the company. And some of the typical problems that you find is that you, know, you have some missing data sometimes in the relational database, or, or you might have like a new domain that we have not seen or that is not stored for some reason in the database. So how, how can you still use the information that you have in the relational database to enrich your, your event data? Right. So you can use machine learning. Um, this slide, I guess you've seen it thousands of times. It's just a typical machine learning pipeline. So what you can do in the, in the example that I just gave is you take the relational database with all the, the domains, the site type and the vertical, and you just, uh, it won't be very large. So um, just like the last speaker said, you know, you don't need big data tools if it's not very large and you can just have it in a one large machine. Um, and then you can just uh, use, you know, whatever you like to use like Python um, or uh, R or some other tools. So uh, at Skimlinks we use Python and uh, we really like the Scikit-Learn machine learning library. So then you can um, take your, that data, you can train your model uh, locally with your preferred tools and then when it comes to the application because you need to apply that model now to billions of rows stored in, the, in those massive text files that's when you start when you use the big data tools um, and at Skimlinks we use PySpark okay. uh, so this is just to give it to give a concrete example so we want to train a model that maps the domain to the vertical so to, to what category that domain belongs to so we know we, we do very standard NLP um, you know, algorithms. We first segment the domain um, and then we need to do some feature encoding and you know, extract the words and, give, and find the right coefficients for each word. And that's very, very standard. You can find this in Python or you know, any, any other <laughs> library. Uh, so yeah, then you do that and then you have a model and just for the sake of uh, showing you, I, I run it, uh, ooh, I don't know why it's like this, um, I run it with uh, the categories that we have and I just pick two random categories and when, you know, very obvious, non-surprising results for the cycling, you know, you have words like cycling or bike on the, in the domain, but they're also mountain, I guess for mountain bikes. You have a, a brand of a bike there, so if you know if you have a, those words or a combination of those words, it's very likely that the domain belongs or, uh, to this category to cycling. And similarly with food and cooking, you will have also food-related words. Okay, so you have your model, you're happy with it. Now, what can you do with it? So then, um, what you can do is that you store the model in S3, for example. I mean, this is what we do at Skimlinks. So that's, that's what I'm saying this. Um, and you can either as a, something that you can read directly from Python or, or just store you know, the bare minimum that you need in the model, which are the, the coefficients. Um, and then uh, we use Spark to run the predictions on the billions of rows that we have in the unstructured data set. And for example, after you've done all the feature processing, which is really what takes a long time, uh, 1.2 billion predictions, we, we can just do that in 15 minutes in 20 EC2 instances. And, and it's very, very simple to scale it up with Spark. Um, that's that one line of code. Um, so model is the scikit-learn uh, object that we have trained before in, the, in our local machine. And then we can just run this line of code and that gives you already all the predictions that you need. 
Okay, so how do we integrate this in our data pipeline? So uh, back in March this year, we did a meetup, uh, a Spark meetup, and I just stole this slide from my colleague Sahan. Uh, so this is the pipeline that we run at Skimlinks for the uh, audience segments. Um, so we start with a, a data store. So we have all our data sitting in, in a stream and it's, we receive one terabyte of events per day. So we need big data uh, tools for this. Uh, so what we do is we run a daily job that aggregates all those events. Uh, we store the intermediate files and then we run another job that aggregates it monthly. And finally, we run some statistical magic, we get the segments and then we can give it to our customers. And so where, what I just, all the example that I just gave where we are enriching the URLs with the category and the, the site type, where would this go? So we basically do it in the daily step. So the data store will have all the, the events and we will have all the URLs there then we can just apply the model that we trained um, in the daily aggregation. And that way we, can, we only need to store the really meaningful information about that event. So because a URL, like a, you know, a computer doesn't understand what a URL is. But if, if you say, okay, this URL belongs to category technology, that's something that you know, is meaningful and that the computer understands. So then, and then you don't need to store the URL, you just need to store what, what, you know, what is meaningful about that URL. Okay, so this is just a cautionary tale um, because you know all this sounds very, very a lot of fun and very easy, but but you always have to be careful when you do this sort of thing because you might end up with a model that performs amazingly when you train it, uh, but then when you apply it on the real data set, which is these unstructured even data, then it, it does a very really poor job. And um, so you always have to understand, uh, you know what the assumptions of the model are, what are the distributions of your data, uh, of the in input features, of the labels, when in the training stage, what, is, what are those distributions in the um, actual appli like applied data set? Is, are they different? Because if they're different, you might have problems with overfitting and then your model will actually give you very, very poor predictions. So in the case of, if you have different labels, so basically, in our example that I gave earlier, let's imagine that you train uh, your model and you have, I don't know, 10% of technology domains, right? Uh, but then you apply your model in the unstructured data set and in, in the actual even data, you have 80% of technology domains. It's a big difference, but it's just to, to make a point that you know, those distributions will affect, you know, the fact that you train on a domain and then you apply it on, a dif on different properties will mean that your model is not as good, you know, won't, won't, be, won't represent your data that you're applying it to. So you are, you ha there are some uh, methods out there to correct for, that, for this problem. For example, if you have a naive base model, you can just change the priors. So the naive base model, uh, you're uh, uh, modeling the posterior distribution of a given label, given the, the words in the URL. And you can, so you have a, the prior probability that that URL belongs to technology, so then you can just change that prior to represent the actual distribution in your um, application data set. And if you have a logistic, if you use a logistic regression, then you can do something called bias correction, which is, um, so this slide without context means nothing, but basically what I did is um, I uh, generated some synthetic data based on, um, on a logistic regression model. And um, so as I vary the input data, uh, I, can, I can see what is the probability that that input belongs to the, a positive uh, instance, uh, to a positive um, output. Uh, so when I do this, if I, what I did then, sorry, um, so is that I subsampled my data set and then I trained my model on a subsampled data set, which is pretty common in data science actually. Especially when you work with very rare event data, data where you have very few positive instances and you have lots and lots of negative instances. In that case, what people do usually is that they sample, they subsample the negative instances to have the same balance of positive and negative. 
But what this means is that when you train your model, the distribution of positives and negatives will be different in the training stage than in the actual application stage. So then you, you, there are some methods out there, there's this bias correction that will try to correct for that difference. Um, and then finally we have also, you can have fi different feature distributions. So to give you an example, at Skimlink some years ago, there was a project that was running that was trying to extract content from our website, from our web page, and understand whether that uh, article was about news or, you know, was trying to do topic modeling to see if, so is it about news, is it about celebrities, is it about sports, right? And what they did is that they only trained a model on Daily Mail and then they applied it on all operation network. But the problem is that, you know, if you have a news article in Daily Mail, it's going to have very specific vocabulary than if you have a news article elsewhere. So obviously you're overfeeding to that and you know, that model was not predicting very, uh, very well. So um, at Skimlinks we've tried a couple of methods. There's this thing called domain adaptation where you train your model in a domain and then you apply it on a different one. Um, and there's this, um, this paper that we implemented but didn't give us a massive boost in performance. Um, so I'll be you know, open for any suggestions afterwards if anybody has done this. <laughs> okay, so conclusion I would say is um, yes, there are lots of machine learning libraries out there, you know, lots of out of the box uh, solutions, but you always have to be very careful uh, on, you know, it's not simply doing, you know, the, in, in the example that I gave, for example, you can have all the best practices in the world, you can do the cross validation to fit your parameters, you can do everything you want, but you might still have really bad predictions if you don't think about, you know, what is the distribution in my uh, training uh, data set and what is my distribution, the actual business data set that I'm you know, trying to apply to. And um, so the three main problems of machine learning enrichment that I touched on, one is scale. So, but you know, we, with Spark it's, it's made very easy for us. Um, then is uh, you know, different distributions in the labels. So there, you, you know, depending on the model that you use, there are multiple methods that you can apply to, to correct the model, and then there's the different distribution in features, which is a bit more difficult, and you know, still a work in progress. And then the slide. We are hiring. So if you would like to solve large-scale machine learning problems, or you know somebody who wants to do that, then please get in touch. And those are our emails. Thank you. Not really a machine learning question, but do you have any problems with the rise of ad blockers and things like Ghostery stripping out your JavaScript from pages and stopping you getting events? Uh, yes, of course. Like that's, uh, but I mean, the, you know, that's the law. So people are uh, allowed to say, you know, we don't. You're allowed to uh, have that uh, in your computer if you don't want to be served ads. Similarly, publishers who, don't, you know, they are also can decide whether they want to run the, this JavaScript on their site. They can decide whether they want their data used for this, for the audience segments. So it's very e easy for them to opt out. Uh, opt out. Um, and, and there's full disclosure in, in everything that we provide, all the services. So, and also the users can, can go on the skimming site and also opt out, opt out. So there are many ways that you can just simply not have your data used for this. Thank you. Thank you so much.